During the Cambrian, over 500 million years ago, larger animal life was starting to take hold around the world's oceans, and in this time period, all kinds of weird animals came to be, many of which being the earliest representatives of many phyla that still live today. One of these many species that are known from this time is Hyperbinia, certainly among the most peculiar looking of them all. Like many well-known Cambrian animals, their first remains were described from the Burgess Shale in British Columbia by paleontologist Charles Walcott in 1912, being named after the close-by Opabin Pass. At about 4-7 cm long, they were initially classified as a member of the Anastrakan crustaceans, which on first glance makes sense. This classification, as will be got into, did however come into question as more on their weird anatomy became known. Regarding their anatomy, they were noted even by Stephen Jay Gould, author of the well-known book Wonderful Life, in where he notes Hyperbinia even when compared to other Cambrian animals as a weird wonder, and regarding them as so important to understanding the Cambrian that he nearly settles on calling the book Homage to Hyperbinia instead. He states his quotes, I believe that Whittington's reconstruction of Opabinia in 1975 will stand as one of the great documents in the history of human knowledge. How many other empirical studies have led directly on to a fundamentally revised view about the history of life? We are all struck by Tyrannosaurus, we marvel at the feathers of Archaeopteryx, we revel in every scrap of fossil human bone from Africa, but none of these has taught us anywhere near so much about the nature of evolution as a little two-inch Cambrian oddborn vertebrates named Opabinia." End quote. This all came from how peculiar they appeared, with them for one, most notably having five large eyes sitting on top of stalks. The eyes, from examining their structure, were likely to have been very basic, being able to distinguish between shapes of light and dark, acting as simple photoreceptors. Because of their simplicity, having five of these visual structures being positioned close together and pointing in slightly different directions would have helped them in being able to better visualise shapes, especially ones passing over them in the case of potential predators, something supported by them angling upwards rather than forwards. Another notable trait was their long proboscis, a third of their total length, which was fused from their frontal appendages, with there being a distal claw at the end which would have helped in grabbing food items. Having spines that pointed forwards and inwards in said claw, they would have likely fed on food particles and small soft-bodied organisms in sediments on the seafloor. The proboscis also likely only had a limited degree of motion from side to side, as fossils preserve the proboscis frequently in a variety of vertical positions, but those in a more horizontal form are much less dramatic. Once the food item was grabbed, the item would have been passed by the proboscis to their ventral mouth, which was interestingly faced backwards, with the proboscis curling back and then depositing it there for the opabinia to feed on. Because of the incredible preservation of the many fossils we have of them, it's been found that they had paired guts to verticular, which would have likely helped in increasing the efficiency of their digestion and the amount of nutrients they could get from their food. Further interesting is their bodies, with them having many lateral lobes alongside a prominent tail fan that would have helped in locomotion, which projected out from the sides of their main body. These structures, while looking similar to animals like trilobites, would have been a lot softer in life, as they do not have the mineralised armour or the tough exoskeleton seen in trilobites and other living arthropods, hence why their bodies are flattened as they are when they are fossilised, and with many of their internal features often appearing as impressions. Their bodies overall from the fossils we have doesn't seem to have been too flexible, however, with only moderate bending being seen, meaning rapid undulations were near impossible in opabinia, meaning for a slower paced movement style than you'd think. These features collectively made their appearance very unorthodox compared to even a lot of other Cambrian animals, with their redescription in 1975 by paleontologist Harry Whittington even prompting laughter when his new reconstruction was first revealed as a paleontological conference, which startled him but also made him push on to both work even harder on his redescription and to prove his interpretation so that no doubts could be left. He didn't get everything right, which will be discussed later, but his efforts made his view of Opabinia a very well-reasoned one at that, all the more appreciated, hence why many pieces of paleoarts have not generally moved far beyond his interpretation. A lot since then has been learned about both them and other Cambrian animals since the 70s, including that Opabinia actually had legs, which helps a fair bit in understanding their ecology. This was a big debate, and one of the most confusing features about them were there evidently being small triangular structures on their undersides, though what they were exactly was not under much contention. These marks were interpreted by Harry Whittington as being extensions of their guts, with an alternate explanation in 1994 by Chen et al, thinking that they were part of the side lobes. Two years later, G. E. Budd hypothesised that these forms were not internal at all, and that they were actually separate from the lobes and lower down in the body. This is where the first idea of these conical structures being actual legs, something like what's been seen in living velvet wombs, came to be known something which for him seemed to be confirmed when mineralised patches that seemed to correspond to hard claws, were found at the ends of the apparent legs. 
Further work in 2007 stated that the legs had the same composition as the gut, which seemed to confirm the original view of Whittington, though another subsequent paper in 2011 suggested that from the chemical composition was not exclusive to the gut of these animals, and that they were actually indicative of the mineralization that occurs in the fluid-filled cavities that you normally find in the legs, though without the claws mentioned earlier. So, instead of being a nimble swimmer like how much of us probably envisioned them being, Opabinia would have likely been doing a lot more in the way of scuttling across the sea floor, and only occasionally getting off the ground when they needed to move quicker. All of this and more has made classifying Opabinia and understanding just what they were all the more difficult, what's with all their weird anatomy, and so a lot of different answers have been brought up in order to figure this out. Harry Whittington back in the 70s concluded that Opabinia wasn't an arthropod, not finding evidence for the jointed limb seen in arthropods, and the proboscis being noted to not being seen in anything that was known in the group. A classification as being closely related to tardigrades also came and went, and that left them as being a stem arthropod, alongside the radiodonts, the clades that includes the much larger Anomalocaris and its relatives. Stem groups were conceptualised around the time Whittington's research was published, with the term meaning a paraphyletic assemblage of members, which excludes the crown group, in this case the arthropods. This helps to offer a means of naming fossils that otherwise don't fit neatly into the systematics defined and based on living organisms, essentially being evolutionary aunts and cousins in the case of Opabinia to living arthropods and their relatives. This is a relative concept, as while they can contain offshoots from members of a lineage earlier than the last common ancestor of the crown group, tardigrades, for instance, are able to form their own crown group, but can also be considered a stem group relative to the true arthropods, though broadly being a panarthropod themselves. Sitting at the base of the arthropod tree, it shows that while all of these animals and the time periods when they lived was very unusual and seemingly alien to us today, they can still be understood when it comes to evolutionary processes. For a long while after Opabinia was described, they were the only genus of their kind discovered, and that remained for over a century until very recently. In 2008, paleontologists described an animal which was also discovered from Cambrian rocks, though being younger in age from Utah. Named Utahora camosa, they were found from the Wheeler Shale, though at the time was instead thought to be a specimen of Anomalocaris, though a recent examination in 2022 found that they were instead much more likely to be closer to Opabinia after being compared with more than 50 other extinct and living animals. 125 of the fossil traits from Utahora were examined and found that Utahora was recovered as an Opabinid in 68% of all the phylogenetic trees retrieved, and only 0.04% for a radiodont like Anomalocaris. This shows that Opabinia did indeed have other relatives, and shows that there is still more to be discovered and re-examined when it comes to them. With only around 42 specimens being known of, they were a rare part of the Burgess Shale, constituting less than 0.1% of the community there, which could either be down to heavy preservation bias or just showing directly how rare they were in comparison to other animals. Whatever the case, more is still to be learned about these five-eyed trunked weirdos, and what them and other Cambrian animals were like and up to back when they were around. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.